Hi everyone, uh, my name is Melanie Thorley and I'm the director of MJT Law. This is Chris D. D. Santana and uh, this, welcome to the Lawcast. First one of 2022, um, been a bit of a delay this year. Um, you can probably see we're all working from home again. Uh, it's I think every first of the year has always been at home. I think we had a lockdown last year and then obviously the year before everyone was everywhere. So it's it's a bit of a theme there, I think. It's getting a bit of a thing. We've been we've been working since the seventh, in fact, from home, and there's no end in sight at the moment. No, indefinitely. Um, I feel very sorry for uh, ah. the small cafes, etc. Ah. That must be in the city because they would be just ghost towns because no one's there. No one is there. Paul, my husband, is working in the city at the moment, and yeah, it's it's quiet. Absolutely, it's properly quiet. But we haven't got on the other side of Australia Day yet, so it's just let's yeah. just wait and see. Yeah. Can you hear that tiny little monster barking? I, I absolutely can. What's what's he, what's he barking at? <laughs> is Seymour. it a piece of leaf or is it? A... He yeah, he's just barking at the fence again. Come on, Seymour. What are you doing? He's just looking at me now as if I'm an idiot, which of course I am because he doesn't understand what I'm saying. Uh, when Seymour finally comes back, I will introduce him to everybody. But we have, as you guys know, we've got a number of animals in the office. And today I'm working from home. eBay's out on her walk, walk with Mad Dogs. I'm going to give a shout out to Mad Dogs and Englishmen. They are bloody brilliant. Um, they've been walking eBay now for months and months. And they've done it without a hiccup, without any issues. And total shout out to them. That's... No, they're doing a fantastic job, I reckon. <laughs> now, now you've got a real... Uh, equal cat versus dog kind of ratio for your for your battles, you know, two yeah. dogs, two cats, roughly I, about the same size. I better get this little monster. Just a moment, peoples. Go See for it. There, there she is. <laughs> hey, everyone. This is Seymour. Seymour is a still a puppy and is barking at shadows at the moment. So we're <laughs> working on that. Working on, on, on the barking problem. It, working on the barking at shadows. He is not a big barker. Um, dudes, 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 there's nothing there. Look at him, he's so naughty. Oh my God, you're so naughty and you're hijacking our podcast. Off we go. Ah, no more barking. He, he must just have a lot to say about employment law. He's really <laughs> vocal and passionate about the, the recent changes. I wanted to talk about today was employment law myths. Well, there's plenty of them, isn't there? And we hear them all the time and we yeah. often shake our heads and think, who, 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 who's saying this? Where is this yeah. coming from? And I kind of feel it's like those weird myths about police, like the policemen can't arrest you if they're not wearing their hat and things yeah. like, like the ones they, that were going around. They must get that all the very time. You know, the, some old timey English law that they think still applies. I mean, we've heard plenty of, uh, you know, the, the Constitution doesn't apply to me because because I'm a sovereign citizen. Um, but yeah, I mean, employment myths are are everywhere. It's almost everything as well. They, they are. The first one I've got on the list is you can't terminate someone while on sick leave. Yeah, just just not true. I mean. We we know that you can't terminate someone because they are sick. That's right. You know, provided it's it's not um, a lengthy or it's not temporary. Yeah. We, we're um, not putting into this concept of frustration of contract. So we're talking about just someone being on sick leave. Um, yeah, usual stock standard. <laughs> I've got a cough. Yeah. yeah, but the uh, the myth really comes from the, this this thought, and and I. For the life of me, can't understand where it's come from. But this thought that basically it's it's almost a stop moment, like it, it's it's almost a shield that can't be penetrated. Yeah. And, and it's almost for an indefinite amount of time. You know, this this they could just be sick for forever. And you know what happens to their employment? Yeah. Um, so uh, so that is definitely a myth, people. So there are ways to terminate someone who is on sick leave. It, it does depend on what hap what's happening and what they do. Um. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to use a really interesting example. This person is on sick leave, but they have decided they're going to download the entire database to their personal computer at the same time. 
Why can't you fire them for that? Yeah, I mean, like, let, yeah, let's use some some kind of serious uh, allegations. And what what if they what if they steal from you? Yeah. What if they? Now, are, are you expected to just let that go on? Yeah. What if what if you realise while they're on sick leave that they're on video stealing? Why can't you fire them for thieving from you? I just there 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 just seems to be this uh, this concept, but. Yeah, so there there are lots of scenarios I can think of that I mean, you can terminate yeah, someone while I they're on sick leave. I would ca caveat it by saying you can certainly fire them while they're on sick leave, but I think there is room within the legislation and, and the case law which suggests that you need to take potentially a lighter touch and, and give a, yeah, a little bit more I'm of a... Yeah, I'm not suggesting that you go full out, you know, knee-jerk reaction mm. all around, but... But there are circumstances where employers should be able to go through a proper process to terminate someone, whether or not they are on sick leave. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's a myth I think should be busted. It, it, there are circumstances where you shouldn't be firing them, of course, but you you can absolutely fire people while they're on sick leave. But I'm gonna, I'm going to extend this to another kind of myth, and this one comes up all the time, which is very similar, which is when one employee is being you know, disciplined for a particular thing and potentially terminated and then the million different other allegations about other employees come in it's almost um some of which may apply to them some of which may not um and it's almost like they do it as a way of exonerating themselves because it, you know you need to deal with all these other issues before you even come to me and it's just not true. I mean, it's not to say that these other allegations might not be true, and they may very well be, and they may also get investigated and lead to terminations, but it doesn't, you know, just because other people are doing something wrong. It deal with the core issue of why that person is being disciplined. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I agree. There's this concept where uh, if, I, if I throw stones while I live in a glass house, I'm going to be okay. And certainly and something that I discussed this week um, was, I really have a problem when you have an employee, especially one who might be middle management or, or management of some description, who is essentially banking allegations mm. as, as almost as a shield. Ready as a shield. You can't attack me because I've got all these other things I want you to think about. Which they, you know, might be quite old. You know, when I say old, they might be six months old. Mm. And they are maybe serious and they may have all the proof in the world, but the I take a really big issue when they haven't brought it up to date, mm. you know, and from an employer standpoint, if you don't know that something is going on, you can't do anything to address it. And I think it's a really big delegation, uh, sorry, moving yeah. away from someone's, yeah, kind of duties as an employee mm. where mm. there is issues and to just almost to, to, you know, in spite of the employer to keep them to yourselves. Yeah. Such that you can never be touched because you can just start flinging mud at others. Yeah. Um, rather than dealing with the issue, because now that you know the company could be liable for whatever's going on, and they had no idea about it. I mean, I have a really big issue with that, and certainly I think people have this idea that if I just have enough allegations, if I make enough dirt on the employer, I'm untouchable, which it's just not true. It's just no. it's just simply not true. Okay. Well, the next one I've got is you can't take sick leave while on annual leave. You can't take sick leave while on your leave. Can you just explore it a bit more? What do you mean? I'm I take I'm on a trip in Bali. Mm -hmm. I'm having a really great time, whoop, 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 and I jump on a motor scooter. I have mm. a bad accident, like apparently a crazy number of Australians do. Yep. And uh, yep. I'm in hospital. I've got a broken leg. I've got some lacerations. I've got a few stitches. Um, I want to take sick leave. And and, uh, and the uh, the myth being that you um, you're on you're on annual leave already. Take your leave. That's what you've got. Yeah, yeah. You can see that doesn't really stack up to what what is written in the legislation. It's simply where you're not fit for work. That's right. Uh, and they're That's not. Right. They're not. <laughs> they're not. That's right. Because uh, there is this concept where you can withdraw your approval. Um, in reasonable circumstances from annual leave, you can get that person back from Bali if you, mm. if, you know, under if the right. it's reasonable in the right circumstances. So if they're not fit for work, people, they can take sick leave. 
yeah, it's. I actually don't like it though. Um, I know, I know it sounds maybe it's the employer in me, but I just think you're on holiday. Just you're on holiday. Like I recently, people, they, I had an accident, and uh, I had an accident particularly on the first day back of work. <laughs> And uh, but I could have easily had that accident while I was, you know, over Christmas time. And uh, I'm going to be out of action for a little while longer. Um, yeah, I don't see if you're already, if, you know, from an it, employer's perspective, I can see why employers want to go. But hang on, I'm already paying you to be off work. Why are you now taking sick leave? Uh, but no, you can take sick leave. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not unlawful. Yep. The obvious benefit to the employee is that they are going away from an entitlement um, that you know they may not get paid for at the end of the, their right. term, right. uh, at the end of their employment. But one of the things that I've always said, and this is not so much as an as a as a lawyer as it is just a you know general worker, mm. is the idea that you know you use your sick leave at all costs. I uh, find uh, yeah. I find to be short-sighted and what i mean is there is plenty of times you know you only get 10 most of us only get 10 days a year and there's going to be times when you're sick especially now with covid but even beforehand it doesn't take much it's two weeks a year um you know for example i need my hands to work <laughs> it's pretty it's common for you to break an arm and an arm yeah. is eight weeks um and you know you really need that the amount of time you get I think is very close to the amount of time you actually need. Um, yeah, should, you so should you shouldn't waste it in this. No, I, people take sick leave. People take sickies and being mm. the day and this and that. I think yes, that is definitely taking the piss. But yes, um, yep, nothing wrong with taking sick leave. Um, swapping out that sick leave um, for annual leave to sick leave and uh, banking that annual leave back in there. Okay, the next one I've got is restraints of trade never work. Uh, the classic, they're not worth they're the not worth paper, the paper they're, they're written on. on. <laughs> well, it's somewhat true, somewhat not, isn't it? It it, it really depends. I um, think well-drafted, restraint to trade under the right circumstances will be successful. Yeah. yeah for the right employee. You yeah. Know, the it's problem is if people use restraints to trade as if it's a stock standard clause that can, they can put into everybody's contract and... That's the problem with them. You can't yeah. use them like that. They the are scattergun about, approach. Just... That's right. They are about specific circumstances. And for those out there who know me, one of the first questions I ask when I when people ask me if I can draft and restrain a trade is what do they want to protect? And what is the job description with which they, they think is going to be exposing them? So I can draft a clause that makes sense for the specific circumstance with which they're trying to protect. Not some kind of catch-all term that's going to make no sense at all for everybody. So, mm. yeah, restraints of trade work, guys. You just got to get it right. Yeah, you just for the right employee. I mean, and for a lot of people, I think I think it captures more people than than what it's given credit for. Yeah, um, especially in the professional that. services. Yeah. You don't need to capture my PA. She doesn't need to be restrained from working for a PA in another law firm. It's mm. not about that. Um, yeah, look, I think... Um, well, a lot of it's it's reflective of uh, our society and our business society. What I mean by is for most small businesses, small and medium businesses, it means your employees are going to be exposed to confidential information and very confidential and your know-how and uh, so the the way you practice etc whereas uh, in a larger organization you may not have so much exposure but because most people work for small and medium enterprise captures an awful lot of people and you're right it's not gonna it's not gonna, it's not gonna cover um the receptionist but your sales people definitely um you know definitely your operations people you know things like that um absolutely and, and uh, I agree. If you get the right restraint, it's going to work. And there are lots of ways to make the restraint, even if it's poorly drafted, work as well. So it's not just about they never, ever work because they're badly drafted, although lots of them are. Um, there are workarounds as well. They're yeah. expensive, but there are workarounds. But what do you say to the 
the classic line of, well, it's just not, it's not fair. You know, why I've I left the organization, why am I in, almost indebted to them? Especially for a lot of people when they leave on not so great terms, which is often when the restraint becomes an issue, it's it's one to another, um, they really feel what's hard done by. Well, look, I think it's, I think it's wrong to restrain a person for working in the same industry, broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, it does depend on on what they're doing. Like if they're a salesman and they're working in the same industry, it is very difficult to stop them from impinging on your wealth, your your ability to make money. But look, I know I am simplifying the salesman job mm. here, but salesmen sell. They sell whatever's in front of them. Mm. So they they can sell this, they can sell that. So you might be able to restrain. A salesman from selling this particular product. Um, you can't stop a lawyer from going and working for a, as a lawyer somewhere else. I don't think that's reasonable. Because mm, mm. they don't can't think, do very much else. Yeah, and I also don't think it's reasonable to just go, well, you can work somewhere else, but you can't work in the state or you can't work in the city because that's where they live. So it's, I think that's unreasonable, but I do not think it's unreasonable to say you are restrained from contacting the clients. You're restrained from pulling away employees of that company. Mm. Um, you know, and it happens all the time as a lawyer. You you run a you run a team. You have you like your team. You leave. You want your entire team to go with you, and you want to take your clients with you. Uh, not necessarily the right way to do about it. But so there's nothing wrong with it. Mm. I just think it's how long and. Like I do this restraint to trade stuff all the time. And one of the things that we need to consider when it comes to the length of time with which someone is indebted um, to this other company is the relationship. What are you trying to protect? If it's your clients, then how long will it take for that client to forget that person works there, work with someone new and be a superstar still? And then when that person comes back and says, hey, look, I'm starting at this other firm, they're going to go, yeah, so great for you. You know, so there is there is a there is a break in relationship or mm. a period of time which it breaks. So I think that's that's what employees need to think about. What are they? Why are they hurting that employer? And are they hurting that employer? Because remember, the loss is also something that needs to be considered for restraint. Mm. My PA going and working for someone else. The only thing I've lost is an excellent PA. So Phoebe, mm. if you're out there, don't <laughs> leave anytime soon. All I've lost is an excellent PA. I haven't lost clients, haven't lost, you know, kudos. You know, there's nothing I've lost. People move. People aren't going to think because Phoebe left that I'm a terrible employer. But what are they going to do next is the thing that you need to think about. Oh, certainly. I, I think one, and this is almost another myth in and of itself, is how, you know, how, how close your clients are actually to the individuals as they are to your company. I think people over exaggerate, you know, oh, he's left, everyone's going to go with him. No, there is a certain level of loyalty to the company as a whole. Sure, they may have some damage to it, but, you know, for the most part, they are loyal to the company rather than to the individuals involved. And they, yeah, they may very well forget about them in a matter of weeks. Yeah. You know, completely. Yep, so restraint to trade can work, restraint to trades don't never work. It's a total myth, people. The next one I've got on my list is you don't need to pay independent contractors super innovation. Yeah, no, and I it like comes it. up all the time. It does. It's a simple time. look on the ATO website and you can see that it's not, right. it's not true. And we, we're not tax lawyers, so we can't go into this in any great depth, but it is important to note that if the contractor is basically performing their services to you, and that is, that is the only thing they're really doing, then yes, it is more likely than not you're going to need to pay that contractor superannuation. It is very hard to avoid that that responsibility. Um, I don't really have much more to say on that, but certainly I'd be advising all people out there who have contractors to revisit their uh, their point of view on that particular point. It's like, sad though that so many underpayments relate to super. I mean, putting aside my, uh, uh, it's been discussed on. Uh, on this podcast about my personal views about superannuation, but because uh, you're also losing out on a springboard effect, you know, you, you the yeah. potential for it to, to become more money. Yeah. Um, 
and I'm it ends up becoming on yours, six, obviously. But I think that the ATO do take into consideration um, the when they when they give a penalty or when they give a mm. fine, they take into consideration the interest lost. Um, so I think there is something there. But you're right. You're absolutely right. There, there's there's no. I, I, if you can't afford to pay super, you've got problems. Can't afford the employee or the no. contractor or whatever it might be. Yeah, this is this is not a this is not a sustainable business model. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty tough. Um, this is this one I actually really like. Uh, you must give three written warnings before. Oh. Time. I really like this one because it sounds really sensible. But it's yeah, a complete but it, it and it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't stack up to reality as well. Let's go back to what those some of those examples are given for. What if what if someone just punches someone on on site? You know what, what if and is it is it three warnings for the same conduct? What are you barking at now? It's really the perils of working from home. I have in my hand. I don't know if you guys can see this, but it's a rabbit's foot. <laughs> You've started your witch's cauldron. You've got, you know, a rabbit's foot, uh, hair of a, you know, fifty-year-old man. You know, there's all sorts of weird stuff in there. That's all right. That's right. But the dog loves them. Um, yeah, these three little more. And you're absolutely right. What if they do something so appalling that they just need to be terminated? Yeah, you, you're limiting yourself to it, but. What about? Are they bound by it? Are they bound so, if they write if they write in the policy that they're going to give three written warnings, that sort of thing? Let's. I'll give two. So, let's say it's in a policy that that says this is how they're going to deal with misconduct, and says you know you'll first get three warnings. Let's just say it's for any misconduct, not just for the same one. Yeah. Um, are they bound to it? I'm going to say largely you need to at least consider the policy before straying from it. I really do. I, th mm. I think if you're going to write in a policy that you need to provide three written warnings, that's the expectation that the employee has. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a hard and fast rule and it's set in stone, but yeah, I think you definitely need to stop and think about what you're doing there. Yeah. I don't like it though. This, 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 uh, this goes back like almost, 15, 16 years. This, this yeah, did, did this used to be oh, like a work, uh, like a work choices thing, or like where did this come from? This came back in the IR. Well, it's been around, you know, for, for eons, but it mm. was it was deleted or dealt with in the Fair Work Act in two thousand and nine. Mm, that it's just not it's not it's, necessary. Warnings are not necessary. No, it's just it's and they they were. They were never written in, as far as I know, into the awards. So the, the, it was literally abolished. But mm. it, it remains as some kind of myth that you need to do it. So employers who don't have a warning process, yeah, policy on how they deal with misconduct, don't need to give three written warnings. They just need to go through the process with which you would expect someone to go through, which is give give the employee a chance to respond to whatever mm. thing is going to cause them um, to be unemployed, if that's what's going on. Give them a chance to pick up their game. Give them a chance to do these things. But they're not written warnings. That's just about notifying them of what's happening and what the ramifications are if they don't do the thing you want them to do. So, yeah, I, I, I actually – it is one of my favourites. Um, it's one – and I'm – and the, the – and then one of my other favourites is coming later. But uh, yeah, so people out there, if you, unless you've got a policy that specifically provides for it, you don't actually have to do that. No, nah, and but that's not to say though that warnings don't have a place in in well, employment. I absolutely, I absolutely think they do, but this concept that you have to do it. I get the phone call all the time. They haven't given me my three warnings. I'm like, uh, okay. What's Sorry. the policy say? Oh, they don't have a policy on it. Therefore, they have to do it. I'm like, uh, just a, just as a kind of practical point, um, three seems a lot as well. Like <laughs> even if we were bound by that or that was some sort of it was grounded with something, three seems an awful lot because are we? I assume you're firing them on the fourth 
mis thing of con of yeah, misconduct, which is an awful lot. We had to do sort of first a verbal warning and then two written. So it's kind of mm. how it worked way back when. So like after the second written warning, which is after the third warning, because the first one was mm. verbal, you can terminate. So you're on thin ground. Yeah, it's but, it's. Yeah. I, I'm not sure I'd be comfortable having a employee working no. for me who's done three things in the last six months, which probably could have been fired for. You know, that's an awful lot. It is an awful lot. Okay, modern awards don't apply if you have a contract. No, no. <laughs> in fact, if, if anything, they're, they're like, equally as, as important. That is widely held, though, that view. Mm. Mm, that it extinguishes it. Yeah. Well, we never remember that awards are a minimum standard. Sure, that's what the contract, but that's what the contract is for. It's to bolster rather than Stop to it. replace. Back up. Because yeah. the awards don't cover everything, obviously. No. Uh, but if you fall under an award and you have an employment contract, both of them will apply. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and if you don't want, if you don't like the award, think about an enterprise agreement. That's right. And look, there are circumstances where if you fall under an award and you're earning over a certain amount of money, you can have an agreement with your employer to be award free, but that that's an additional agreement past your employment contract. So yes, people, awards will always apply in almost every single circumstance. And this goes to the this this goes to my next one. The award doesn't apply if you're paying over award rate. Oh, so rather than like, sure, like, it might it, it puts aside the entitlements and things like that, but you're actually still getting paid for. That's right. Like, so, so people see awards. I think, and this myth is about people seeing awards as purely a money-based um, exercise. Mm. They, the the award says they're meant to be earning. I don't know, I'm going to make I'm going to make round figures here, people. They're, gonna, they're meant to be earning a thousand dollars a week based on the work they're doing, with all the um, with all the penalties and the the meal allowances, et cetera, that apply. But in fact, they're getting paid one thousand five hundred a week. Therefore, the entire award doesn't apply. I love and, it. I, I like this myth it, because it's just so stupid. <laughs> I, I think it's the misunderstanding kind of comes from two things. One that the award uh, is only about money. Like if, if you look at any award. Money is a small section of it, like a large section, actually majority of it is around conditions rather than nice. than remuneration. But I think it also comes to a confusion around that awards don't apply to anyone of, of management. Yeah. You know, if like you manage someone, you're out. If you're a manager, you're award free. Or, um, yeah, I really, I really like these myths about the awards. There just seems to be so many that float around about what you what, who is and who isn't falls mm. under an award. But I do like these ones where if you pay over the odds, the award doesn't They're apply. Out. Yeah. And I really like this one because it's so not true in so many ways. Even if you are paying over the odds, just by the fact that you're paying a salary does not mean that this person isn't also entitled to some of the other things that are monetary compensation in the award, unless you have a contract that expressly states that you are the, this extra money is in lieu mm. of all these other benefits, which which you would be entitled to under the award. This is so much more complex, complicated than what people are giving it credit for. Oh, for sure. Um, <laughs> and I mean, awards are messy at the best of times. Um, but yeah, certainly be cautious. And so many of the the misunderstandings, and it can be really dangerous for an employer, or really risky because of I mean, all the there's so much in those awards that if you are just ignoring it or just displace it to later come up as an issue, because they are they're massive, a lot of them. Yeah, and I always tell my um, clients and prospective clients, reading awards is like landing the space shuttle into the Hudson River. You really need to take your time. Stop and mm. look at the whole document. Don't take one word, one sentence, one tiny subclause. You've got to look at this as a whole document and really think about what it's trying to achieve here. Um, you know, awards are complicated. Just by paying more money than what is necessarily owed under an award is not going to get you award free. It's just not going to get you over that line. But I do like that one a lot. I've got another one. You're Go not going to have bad references. 
You're not allowed to give bad references. You yeah. have to scream praises, even if they were uh, <laughs> a terrible employee. So, can't give a bad reference. Can't give a bad reference. I like it. I like it a lot. Every employee gets a get out of jail free card when they leave, even if they throw attention on their way out. To tell you what, it really, uh, there's a reason why references are kept very brief. The questions you get asked are like extremely factual. You know, did they work for you? Did they work for this amount of time? Did they do this job? And it doesn't go much further than that. Um, because if everyone's getting the praises, then it just diminishes the whole whole exercise but yeah. i mean there are circumstances when you can't obviously if there's some sort of confidential nature to their to the ending of their employment yeah or well, you're not being honest you're just yeah pessimistic. lying you know and there's a sort of a and I'm, I'm using the word in the loosest term possible you know some sort of defamatory element to it because all the person's done is leave their job mm. you know there's nothing else that's happened there yeah i <laughs> I get asked more often than not, would I rehire that person? That's a very interesting question. It is a very interesting question. Because, you know, if they've resigned, you know, they did it for their own reasons. But if they came back to you tomorrow, would you would you take them back? It's actually a really good question, though, I think. Yeah, and uh, I have taken them people back. Mm. Phoebe resigned a little while ago to explore some different options in relation to her degree. And she's back. Nearer to the same thing twice. Mm. Um, you know, people people come back. Um, yeah, so I get asked that a lot. Would you rehire them? And I yeah, think it's yeah. a really interesting question because you can just go no. No, or and that that says an awful lot because what you're saying is now ha ha having gone through their entire employment and now getting to know them a bit more, I may not have hired them in the first place. Yeah, knowing what I know now or knowing what they've become, it's not interesting. I, I wouldn't take them back. Yeah, so uh, look, people out there, as long as you're not treating them in a discriminatory, I mean, I'm talking about illegalities here. There's mm. no reason why you cannot be honest in a review. Yeah. Um, in a reference. Um, I wouldn't go to town, but I would certainly, you know, there's, there's no reason you, you can't be honest. And to be honest, everybody has flaws. Mm. So mm. if you give a review, that is only shining reference. You're starting to wonder what the truth is. Because what you want to hear is something that they can't do. What yeah. is what is it that no one's perfect? So what's the imperfection here? Yeah, what's why are they not there, for example? But well, well, well just just more than that, like for instance, it might be that they were brilliant on the telephone. They were absolutely brilliant at getting stuff done. But the word skills weren't really very good. Mm. You know, it, it might just be something innocuous. Uh, it could be that you know they've never they've never worked on a computer system like a practice management system before. So there might be some downtime in their you know there's, there's an information in experience. Yeah. Yeah. So you know what you need is is an honest answer. Mm. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and they always seemed up to work on time, but only just, and it kind of bothered me. Mm. Right. Um, so no, I don't see, I don't see any reason why you can't give a bad reference as long as you're not getting up to mischief in the reference. Yeah, you're not, you're not breaching a confidentiality agreement, or yeah, you're sort of defaming them, or it's just not true. It's just yeah, nasty. Now the last but least, extending probationary periods. Oh, no, sorry, the second to last, extending probationary periods. Well, let's talk about the, the big myth that's there, which is probationary periods. It's just full stop. Um, you know, we know that, sure, you can't bring an unfair dismissal application. So, uh, for certain circumstances, six months, some 12. Um, but there is plenty of other reasons why people get fired. It's not this idea they can be fired for any reason, because if it's discriminatory, if it's for breaches of general protections, probationary period is completely useless. So what would be the benefit of extending a probationary period then? I think probationary periods full stop are just a just a way of putting an employee on notice that they're getting reviewed. Yes. Um, and that they need to pick their game up. But when I keep their game 
good. But my issue with having them, and this is a more management thing than anything, is you're almost encouraging them to slack off after the probationary period. You know that we expect this as your performance, but then now that you're actually more, ex you're actually more experienced, you're more productive because everyone knows there is a certain, you know, delay in productivity when you get a new employee. But then after six months, we're kind of implying that the person can't slack off because they're out of their probationary period. If we're, if we're really sticking firm to it, um, I don't like the optics of what you're giving off. Yeah, look, it's weird, isn't it? Because probationary periods in the contract normally state during your probationary period, your employer may terminate for any reason. Actually, that's not true. We know that's not true. You can't do, you can't terminate for a discriminatory reason, for a general protections reason. There may be available, may not be available to them under your dismissal, but there could be breach of contract. You know, it's not that doesn't exist as a as a it's a legal anomaly. We also know about probably six years, seven years ago, probationary periods were removed from all the awards. Mm. So you won't find them in awards anymore. And I would certainly, uh, I'm not going to say that I've read every single award because there's like 180 of them and not every award comes across my desk. Like the Helicopter Pilots Award is not one I've actually really looked at in any great detail. Or the Janine Award is another one I haven't looked at in any detail. But certainly it's my experience that they've been taken out of awards. So they really are just a legal anomaly that people like to put in. They really, what they're really saying is, we're keeping an eye on you. You're right, but can you extend it then? Can you say to somebody, you're based in your employment contract, let, let's look at it from a contractual position. Mm. Is it lawful for an employer to say into your contract, you have a probationary period of six months, and then at, at week, five months and three weeks, you're told, oh, look, we're going to extend it a further three months. Does the contract uh, allow for an extension? Does it say, you know, and, and can be extended, you know, as reason required problem. or something like that? That's the problem, isn't it? Like, if we're talking about now it's actually just a contractual thing, we're letting them know that we're just keeping a close eye on them. If the probationary period is contractually six months, is it lawful? Is it okay to extend it? I think you. I think it, provided there isn't that that ability, I think it would be a breach. I think there's going to be trouble. Yeah. I, I, I mean, don't think it would be a material breach, but I think I think there's going to be problems because the employee is going to say, "But hang on, I relied on this contract, and I was relying on it, and I was performing it. Mm. So now you don't want to perform that particular clause. You want to change it. Yeah. Which what's going on here? Who? Which are we but just? Are the obligations flowing both ways? So yeah, I, I don't. I think there's going to be some problems. I think it's probably if you're the sort of organisation that does extend probationary periods, then you need to have a clause in the contract that provides for it. Yeah. I think that's probably the sensible way forward. But the danger with extending it is if you have forgotten about um, the actual legislative part of of what a probationary period is. And what I mean by that is that it's actually just to stop unfair dismissals after, let's just say it's six months for this particular example, is if you extend it and then you seek to rely on it, thinking that it still remains as in you can terminate for any reason, and you're now into, let's say, month eight, you're going to have issues that you're going to fall into, especially if you yeah. are firing them for a reason that isn't really valid. Um, this is exactly right. This is fascinating, isn't it? Now I'm going to move away from these myths because uh, I think we've we've. Uh, there's plenty more, but we'll uh, we'll keep that for another day. I was watching this BBC series called War of the Worlds. Yes. It's a three-part series, so it's not the one that we all know about. Oh, maybe the SBS one. I think where it's this three-season malarkey. This is yeah. three episodes, all an hour long, and I watched them. I think I watched it on ABC. Um, I view, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Um, and it was set back when War of the Worlds was actually written by Orson Welles. Mm. It was set back in time. And yeah? it's, it's in the 30s or the 40s or something. No, it? it's it's set in Victorian age. Oh, right. So yeah. at the turn of the century. Mm. Sorry, not the century, the last century. So Which is strangely still called turn of the century. But... Yeah. yeah, 122 years ago. And it was 
it was set in such a way, and I just I really like this. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a point in a moment. Um, it was set up to what happened next because if we if we know War of the Worlds and you've listened to the Orson Welles, then we know it didn't take long for those pesky Martians to all die out because of the bacteria that mm. everywhere. And this was this was leaning on the fact that when the Martians were sucking the blood out of people, which is what Orson Welles was you know, alluding to when they were saying they were eating us, um, that they were catching typhoid. Right, very old. Oh, I'm sure it's still around somewhere, but yeah. Yeah, it's 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 one that you can vaccinate against now, obviously. Which I, <laughs> and I really like this concept where it's set after typhoid killed all the aliens off, mm. but the Earth was still covered in this weird alien red um, growth. And if you remember in Orson Welles, they covered the Earth and made the sky red because of it, with this red stuff to make it look like Mars, because back then we thought Mars was red and we know it basically is, but you know, let's set aside our, our you know. We know it's more of an orange, like a, yeah. not yeah. too so, dissimilar to the, our desert. Yeah, so we've got all these, we've got a few amount of people left um, who may or may not have typhoid and the islands are all dead. And this is just this sort of like zombie apocalypse type situation where this red stuff is causing the people for the for the water source to be poisoned so people are no longer being able to have children mm. and the food source is also disappearing because you can't grow or uh, in earth that's had this uh, red stuff growing in it and uh the story is actually a bit more macabre than that you could grow over um uh gravestones of those people who have had typhoid so once, so the concept was they would, their bodies would disintegrate into the earth, and typhoid would be inside the earth, and the stuff mm. would come on it. And I just, I just think this is kind of um, sort of this post apocalypse that kind of Martians come to Earth sort of situation. I'm just thinking about how if they had eradicated typhoid uh, in this story, mm. the aliens would have survived, and they would have, you know, killed everyone. Yeah, I really like this kind of post kind of um, story. And I, I like the concept where vaccinations back then, um, you know, now they were looking at, uh, you know, how to vaccinate or how to culture this typhoid and stuff mm. like that. I just kind of like this concept where we look at it from the aftermath. It's a little bit like, um, is it Robert? Something Roberts who wrote a book about what happened, what would happen if the Nazis had won the war? Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah there's... It's actually a TV series, I can't remember about it, um, where it takes this assumption that they win, the Axis powers win, and it's set, oh, I can't remember the name, but it's set in America post-war, where uh, it's basically split down the middle, Texas almost being the the boundary, and Germany's on, I believe, the East Coast, and Japan, is, German. And Japan is on the West Coast. Right. And there's like growing tension between the two about about um, those two fighting, and then there's kind of a American kind of underground uh, type of movement to try and because, overthrow both of them. It's quite fascinating. I like it. I um, like it a lot. Yeah, I like these kind but, of stories of what happens next because we all know. I mean, Orson Welles is is they all thought it was true at the time, it freaked mm -hmm. everyone out, which I think is really hilarious, but it did. Well, um, you you watch plenty of kind of apocalypse movies, one of your absolute faves. <laughs> having having done all that and watched everything you've seen and read whatever, you, if you were to point to one thing that would the most likely to be, you know, an apocalyptic event, what would it be? I like these illnesses. The the, the I think you know obviously zombies are going to have you know there's a logistical problem there of yeah, you know, zombies don't exist. Mm. Um, <laughs> aliens coming to Earth, uh, a meteoroid hitting the Earth and creating a, um, an Earth, um, an extension level event. Mm. There are a few that I watch that um, are about the rapture, which are interesting. So the if you are a, rapture if you being 
the, the belief in the higher power where mm. God comes back, takes all the goodies and leaves all the baddies. Mm. Um, I'm simple. I'm simplifying it because, you know, the rapture yeah, the, is not. We're not going to be talking about Genesis or whatever. Genesis book about, five or whatever it is. I'm not getting into a philosophical debate, debate about religion, but yes, that the, there's an awful lot I watch about the rapture. I actually also like these ones where we're the we are our own destruction. These, As in we all just bomb each other to hell. No, we create such a poisonous um, earth that it's actually not sustainable anymore. This kind of mm. green, green kind of concept that ecologically we we do something that tips the balance against us, and it just keeps going. So, at the moment, you know, there, there's a lot of people out there who will say that we're on a precipice, and you know, mm. it could go either way, and we don't want to tip the balance, so we we all fall off, and that's the end of us. And but a lot of these are. Apocalypse movies are about tipping the balance, and it just happens really fast. Like you've got a ball bearing, and whatever, you know, off it goes. Which is strange because yeah, within, that doesn't really make a lot of logical the sense. The Ice Age and all that sort of thing. Yeah, I I actually really like those ones, and I don't know how true they are, but that one is also one I think is probably if I'm going to be a doomsday prepper, I might prep for something like that. I mean, is it isn't it naive of us as humans though? to think that we're going to be the maker of our own doom like that we are so powerful that we can destroy ourselves and what i mean is earth's had what i think it's five mass um extinction events and none of them we would have had any ability to stop it, it, no, we, they no, would have been completely out of our hands uh, the concept that the dinosaurs were killed by a meteorite uh, that you know caused them or when the yeah. subterranean crust or whatever blew and uh, all the volcanoes went off and uh and the you know there's a massive ash cloud that killed everything i mean we know had no ability to stop that we don't and have it, any ability to stop that yeah, yeah. I, guess, I guess it's you're not right. even it's kind of almost egotistical of us to think that that we are so powerful that we can destroy the, the earth still with covid we've done a very good job of wiping out quite a number of people on this planet just by just by moving around my my hot take on on apocalypses are that i agree that it will probably be a like a a disease or a you know a, you know we destroy the earth or something but i don't think it will be extinct kind of i think we have the ability to plateau our population right um, so you're saying that although Although we will wipe out most likely an awful lot of us, humans will survive yeah. at some level. Because I think fundamentally our thing that makes us different to most animals is our ability to survive as a human race and to I like do it. necessary in order to survive. But I think we could definitely plateau it. I mean, I like that it. might be horrific, but. There's, which, which is that? The one with Dennis Quaid in it, where they, um, where that kid that plays. Spider-Man is stuck in the New York library with a bunch of other people. Come with that, uh, day I... after tomorrow? Yeah, mm -hmm. the day after tomorrow. Is when the day after tomorrow, the yeah. The library and it's like hopefully, snowing and then it's flooding or something. Yeah, hopefully our viewers will, will know the one that I'm talking about. Dennis Quaid says something really interesting to his, uh, to his team that are walking mm -hmm. from Washington, I think, mm -hmm. to to New York, when he's asked whether they'll survive this, he says, well, we survived the last ice age. We certainly have the ability to survive this one. And I think that's what you're saying, right? We're, we're actually mm. quite, got a quite, like, quite a lot of ingenuity. We, we, we might be able just to get through it because we're not so dumb that we will just go, oh, well, let's just stand out in the rain and get killed sort of thing. Nah. Yeah, yeah I, I like it. I like it. So yes, anyway, so I'm going to plug that show. I'm going to plug it as a really fun thing to do what happens next. Um, and I like it because it's this kind of this concept where typhoid, which is now eradicated, was the thing that saved them all. <laughs> I love it. Now, obviously, I think typhoid should be, um, should be eradicated. I am a big fan of vaccinations, but uh, I just like this concept where it was the thing that didn't, um, that, that survived. I've got one last thing as a segue from right, being sick. One, one last, last thing, people. Employees 
sick with COVID. Long service, um, do they take sick leave? Is it in the... I think really quickly, if, if they're sick, like if they've got COVID, uh, it's, it's sick leave. If they are just isolating because they're a close contact and they're not caring for everyone who happens to also be in the same household, which is pretty likely, because that's probably how they got it and why they're a close contact, then it'd be un well annual leave if they've got any or unpaid, um, and the, or unpaid leave. Um, but I think chances are they're probably going to say that they're caring for the people of their household. So it'd be yeah, I think you're right. I don't think it's a responsibility of the employer um, to, to pay that's not an accrued leave. Um, the interesting question is, can you can you use your long service leave? Um, I think the I short mean, answer is no, you can't. No. There, there's no there's no way certainly here in Queensland to cash out long service leave without going to the Queensland Industrial Relations Commission and asking them for permission to do that. I mean, because yeah, you can't, there isn't that ability. Um, maybe, I mean, can, maybe. Can, I mean, under New South Wales change legislation specifically to allow people to use their long service leave um, if they got sick with COVID. But this yeah. goes back to the 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 this kind of fundamental question is why are you taking the leave and what is long service leave designed to do and there's lots of things about doing it at the last minute and all this sort of stuff so before i guess what i'm going to do is leave with a a word of warning for all those people out there who've accumulated long service leave and all those employers out there who know that they've got accumulated long service leave for their employees really stop to think about it before you start letting long service leave get used yeah. i'm not saying you can't i'm just saying it's not as simple as it. using the annual leave and yeah, that's a hot take and i think that wraps it up for this week it does wrap we'll it up. Everyone. Got, I, I had a actually really fun time talking about these myths today um yeah. welcome back everyone Happy New Year, and we're fast coming up to Chinese New Year, which we are going to be celebrating next week on Tuesday. Super looking forward to that. And uh, Chris, you're at home at the moment. Yeah, well, and we'll be for a while. Um, I do have plans this year of going to Thailand, so we might be doing a podcast from uh, from an island in Thailand, which will be very interesting. Be happy to see that. Well, people, thank you for watching and listening. You were listening to the Lawcast from uh, MJT Law. Um, it was Christy Santana and Melanie Thorley, and see you next time. See you in two weeks. See ya. See ya.